Thank you, Jonathan, very much, and thank you for coming out from uh, the East Coast to the beautiful weather we've got here. Okay, uh, we're running a little behind, but we're going to go into next the, the panel A, which is the new realities for the renewable energy uh, industry. Uh, you all have these cards in the middle of your table. We've changed the system a little bit, little bit so that if you have a question, please mark your questions, write them down on these cards. Uh, we will have IBEDC staff walking around. Just raise your hand, and they will pick these up and bring them up to the front. Uh, this is to help those of you that are too shy to uh, get up in the microphone and speak. You can still ask your questions, okay? Uh, we're trying to make this more efficient. Okay, so we're going to bring up the, uh, the first panel. And the moderator for the first panel will be Tom DePousses. And he's the president and chief executive officer for Thomas DePousses and Associates, LLC. Uh, Tom DePousses is the president and chief executive officer of Tom DePousses and Associates, LLC, a business consulting firm with offices in El Centro, California, and clients located in the United States and Mexico. Business activities include strategic planning, business management, real estate development, government affairs, economic development, international trade, board governance, and banking. So at this time, could I get Tom DePousses up here? And he will introduce his panelists. Tom. All right. Well, good morning. As you can see, we have uh, the lineup there. Um, we actually have some fantastic panelists and uh, as stated, we're running a little bit late, so if the panelists could come up here, please. I realize that some of you may want to run over to the bathrooms or get some coffee right now. And please do so, but we're going to proceed forward with the panel. Uh, let me introduce to you Scott Flint, whose microphone is being adjusted. Scott is with the California Energy Commission Program Manager. He's in charge of the Desert Renewal uh, cons Conservation Plan. Uh, he has over 25 years experience in the natural resource management field, including water quality planning, hazardous waste cleanup, wetland inventory and assessment, and conservation land management. Uh, his experience includes 20 years with the California Department of Fish and Game and three years with the California Energy Commission. Uh, Scott has been the California DRECP uh, planning effort since 2008. Uh, next to him, is Martin Herman. Martin is a serial entrepreneur with 23 years experience in the solar, clean tech, and high tech industries. He founded 8 Minute Energy, which is now among the largest independent developers of solar PV in the United States, with a portfolio of over 2,000 megawatts and a track record of over 300 megawatts in executed PPAs. Uh, Martin also developed a solar PV modular manufacturing plant as the, he was involved with that as the chief strategy officer with Advent Solar. Uh, prior to this engagement in renewables, he owned a semiconductor tool company for 10 years, which he promptly sold to Intel, made a ton of money, and then for the next six years uh, after the acquisition, he served as a member of Intel's senior management team. I might add that Peter and I both met each other at the 2009 Renewable Energy Summit. And uh, it's interesting because last month we had a chance to see each other again at the groundbreaking of the Mount Signal Solar Project. Next to him, well, actually, one person over him is uh, Tina Shields. But let me introduce to you Carl first, then we'll do Tina. Uh, Carl is the interim energy manager for the IID. He is responsible for planning and directing the energy department's administration, including oversight regulatory policy, operations and energy infrastructure, resource planning, system and, tra uh, system and trading operations and generation. 
Stills directed the development of the Integrated Resource Plan and Transmission Master Plan. I mean, Carl's just amazing. He also works to identify and pursue and contact for renewable energy projects to meet AIID's renewable energy portfolio requirements. With more than 35 years' experience in the energy industry, uh, Stills has been instrumental in IID's effort to promote and explore renewable energy resources. Uh, he has led IID's effort in developing uh, opportunities in na native geothermal projects in the Imperial Valley. Uh, Carl went to IVC, Imperial Valley College, and Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado, where he studied civil engineering and business. His counterpart on the water side is Tina Shields, who is sitting next to him. Tina uh, is the Colorado River Resource Manager for the Imperial Irrigation District. She oversees the IID's Colorado Water Supply entitlement with a focus on implementation of water management policies and coordination of various water conservation and transfer programs. Uh, she represents the district and its interest at the local, state, and federal level in protecting the IID's senior water rights and its annual 3.1 million acre-foot allocation of the Colorado River. She's a registered civil engineer and has provided technical guidance and recommendations for water policy decisions at IID and assists the implementation and the oversight of the quantification settlement agreement uh, which we know is a historic agreement that allows us to, allows us, California, to live within its 4.4 million foot acre all allocation for the Colorado River. She is a graduate of Cal Poly uh, Pomona, has a bachelor's degree in civil engineering, and has completed coursework towards a master's in public administration at San Diego State University. She's licensed by the state of California as a professional civil engineer and land surveyor in training. Uh, next to her is Armando Villa, and you can see why they're sitting next to each other. Uh, I'll explain that in just a second. Armando is the Director of Planning and Development Services for the County of Imperial, where he serves as the Secretary to the Planning Commission and Airport Land Use Commission, Chairman of the Environmental Evaluation Committee. Uh, he served over 23 years in land use and environmental planning and economic development experience in both the public and private sector. He has worked at various local jurisdictions in Los Angeles, Riverside, and Imperial counties. In addition, Mr. Villa has private sector experience in land acquisition and development. Uh, he is a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners and holds a certificate in economic development from Fresno State University, a master's degree in public administration from uh, California State University, San Bernardino, and a Bachelor's of Science degree in Urban and Regional Planning from Cal Poly Pomona. He is also an active member of the California Planning Association, National Association of Environmental Professionals, the California Association for Local Economic Development, CalEd, uh, the International City County Management Association, and the International Economic Development Council. As you can see, we have extremely well-seasoned, well-educated, and highly experienced individuals to talk about the new realities of renewable energy in industry. And with that, why don't we kick it off with Scott? Well, thank you. Whoa. Sorry about that. Well, thank you, and um, thanks for inviting me here today. I'm going to start out with a little overview on a project that the state is working on being led by the Energy Commission, and that is the Desert Renewable Energy Conservation Planning effort. And then I'll t uh, also I'll touch a little bit on, give you an overview of that, and I'll talk specifically about the benefits of that plan would have for um, incentivizing and assisting with development of renewable energy in California. <clears throat> so first of all, what, what is a Desert Renewable Energy Conservation Plan? Under um, <clears throat> what it actually is under um, state law is an NCCP, a Natural Community Conservation Plan that is designed to both facilitate development and to, at the same time, um, conserve species and natural communities that may be impacted by that development. So the NCCP portion has two elements. One is an energy development element or footprint, 
And in a traditional NCCP, that would be a lot like urban growth boundaries and limit lines that are growth limit lines that are set up, areas that would be planned for development. Since we didn't have that um, already set up for this planning effort, we set that up um, in partnership with the development um, development interests that have been participating in the planning effort and other state and federal agencies that are partnering with us. On the, <coughs> on the um, habitat side, there will also be a reserve design that does two things. One, it it establishes a framework for long-term conservation of species and natural communities that allows the development to happen within the development areas. And secondly, it provides opportunities um, for mitigation pro mitigating project effects within that reserve design as needed uh, as projects are developed. So the plan is, is um, basically encompasses the entire desert region of California, both the Mojave and Sonoran Desert region. Um, uh, portions of Kern County, Inyo County, San Diego County, and Riverside counties, and the entirety of San Bernardino County, and of course Imperial County are included within that planning um, boundary for the DRECP. Under federal law, it will also be an, an HCP on private lands. One of the problems um, early on with developing exciting renewables on private lands in California, which in areas that have listed federal species, um, was the time frame that it took to get a, an HCP, a habitat conservation plan, and permit from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to be able to develop those areas. So. Uh, as part of the DRECP solution, that permit will be built in um, to the planning effort. So the four agencies, to pull this off, the four agencies working together in cooperation are <clears throat> the California Energy Commission, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. That's, that's newly renamed from the Department of Fish and Game. That's their new name. And if you didn't get them confused with the Fish and Wildlife Service before, now you can because they have almost the same name. Um, at this point in time. Also, the Bureau of Land Management, who um, has a priority for putting out renewable energy on public lands uh, from the uh, Obama administration. And then also the, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which again is necessary to do the permitting on the private land components. So these four agencies have been working in cooperation. And um, as mentioned earlier, um, this cooperation has been going on for a while and, uh, and has got attention and, at the governor's office and we take part in those meetings at the governor's office routinely to keep things on track and facilitate um, development of the plan and development of renewables. So not only has this team been engaged in um, developing this DRECP desert-wide plan, they've also been engaged in troubleshooting and permitting the individual projects um, that have been permitted by the state and federal agencies um, towards our energy goals and uh, towards meeting our energy goals and those projects um, are coming on, permitted and coming online now. So we're taking forward some of the concepts and lessons that we learned from permitting ind individual projects into the plan. So this planning effort is somewhat unique uh, from other NCCPs. So we have we do have quite a few, uh, at least 20 NCCPs in different stages uh, go, uh, throughout the state. Some are in the planning phase and some are in the, in the implementation phase. And if any of you are familiar with San Diego County and city permits under NCCPs, those are some of the earliest that we've done in California. And a lot of their development runs under those NCCPs. Typically, they are, um, well, they are all implemented locally, um, although they are developed in cooperation with the state and federal agencies. And the way it works is the permitting authority from the state and federal agencies for endangered species take is then conferred to the local agency. They can act on, on behalf of the state and federal agencies in issuing that take authority to projects that they're uh, approving at the local level. This plan is being designed to work the same way. However, um, it's being led actually by the 
agency planning staffs right now at the, at the four agencies that I mentioned. Uh, we are working closely with the counties and cities and other local agencies in this process, uh, but primarily now it's being driven by the agencies and give, this has given the importance of this issue to the state. Um, and again, the intent is to set it up so that at any time counties can come on board and cities can come on board to sign on to the plan and help us <coughs> develop it from there forward or to implement it as developed. So this, and through this process, although we have no formal sign-ups from the counties we, and cities, we have a lot of input from them as stakeholders and they have been participating in the planning process for several years. So one of the primary um, drivers of why, do, why did we want to put this plan together? One of the primary drivers is to um, facilitate the siting of renewables in California to meet long-term greenhouse gas reduction goals. And those goals are laid out through 2050. The plan is designed to help the energy sector meet a portion of those goals as required. And, and a certain amount of those goals are expected to come from renewable energy uh, and primarily solar, wind, uh, solar of all types, wind and geothermal in the planning area, DRECP planning area. DRECP focuses on utility scale uh, development, permitting utility scale development, and that is defined as 20 megawatts and above for the planning effort. So it also would include small and distributed systems of, up, of 20 megawatts and above where they might need incidental take coverage for species impacts. Um, <clears throat> but basically it's the utility scale component and it, and it doesn't mean that this is the only piece of the solution to uh, rolling out renewables in California. This, this utility scale development has to happen with uh, improvements in energy efficiency, um, improvements in um, a development of solar rooftops and those sorts of things. So there are other things contributing to that goal besides just utility scale renewable. This plan addresses utility scale renewable. The reason we're focusing on the desert is we have a large area of uh, uh, most of the solar geothermal resource, almost 100% of it is in the desert region of California. That is the highest solar insulation. Um, which uh, enables siting the solar thermal projects. And in, in the desert, there's also a high uh, wind resource and, of course, the largest ge geothermal resources that have been identified and are actually in production are in Imperial County uh, in the planning area. So we're looking to facilitate the development of those technologies primarily through the plan. Of course, to uh, move that energy within, uh, between uh, what we're calling development focus areas in the plan and to the load center, we have to get it on the grid and we have to have the associated transmission uh, to do that. So the plan also anticipates covering the impacts from um, all of the associated transmission needed to move that energy within the planning area. So currently, um, where we are with the plan is we have um, alternatives developed. We had those come out in December for public review and we're working our way towards a draft um, public review document uh, for the planning effort. Um, the alternatives that we are looking at and came out in December range from about identification of about 1.1 million acres of what we're calling development focus areas or DFAs uh, to about 2.5 million acres of potential development areas. Now, we don't expect all those to be developed within that framework to allow for flexibility in siting. Um, we are looking at um, somewhere between 200,000 to 350,000 acres of ground disturbance that would be needed to meet the energy goals that our uh, CEC demand forecasters have said that we would need to reach by 2040 uh, to stay on target to re reaching our 2050 um, greenhouse gas reduction goals. So that's kind of a basis for the planning effort. So 
So I'll just wrap up with talking a little bit about the benefits. So once we define these areas and have a reserve system, what what are the benefits of having these areas or these uh, development focus areas that we have identified in the plan? Um, in general, because in general, the development focus areas will come pre pre permitted for endangered species take from both the state and federal government, and that can be executed locally by the counties that sign on to the plan or executed by the Energy Commission um, when it uses its authority to license a project. Scott, thank you for, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that information. Uh, it certainly is a good program, and here in Imperial County, it provides a lot of opportunities for work with you and with the uh, state. Uh, the next speaker is Martin Herman. Martin? Can I come over there? Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Martin Hellman. I'm uh, with 8 Minute Energy. Uh, and uh, we have prepared some slides, so uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to share it with you in, in a second. But well, thanks for giving me the opportunity to provide a developer's perspective on uh, uh, the new reality in the energy industry. Um, I'll uh, start with. Sorry, try to figure out the, all right, here we go. So I'll start with a brief company introduction. I'll promise it to keep it really brief. Um, and then uh, briefly about the status of uh, status uh, of solar in Imperial Valley. Uh, because the topic is called new realities, I'll, I'll do a reality check on where our industry is and uh, talk about opportunities and a call to action for the Imperial Valley. Uh, Admitted Energy is uh, focusing on uh, solar PV. Uh, we have been engaged in the Imperial County since 2009 and uh, has been for us a great experience working with the local agencies. And we, we're working in uh, about uh, six or seven counties in California. Uh, and I have to say that uh, with the Imperial County and with the IID, uh, Imperial County has, or Imperial Valley has two agencies that are understanding and embracing renewable energy like uh, almost no other county in California, and I think that's uh, very good news for the developer. It's also good news for the local uh, economy, and I think the success of the Imperial Valley speaks for the quality of the agencies and the support. We have also been able to make a lot of friends and uh, close friendship over the last three and four years, and it has been really a, a great experience for us. With regard to solar in, uh, in Imperial Valley, we developers have been talking and promising jobs and construction and, and projects for quite a long time, and uh, it has taken uh, probably longer than uh, we all have thought about. But uh, good news is that uh, solar is here, and solar creates jobs, and it's a true uh, economic stimulus for Imperial Valley. And uh, there are a number of large and solid projects like Tenasca and LS Power, the Mount Signal project that we and uh, AES developed, uh, you have at the north end uh, solar gen and uh, sun peak solar so there are a large number of, of projects uh, that are happening and uh, i think that's uh, truly the good news and i think we all can be very proud of uh, having achieved that i think the foremost uh, the thanks goes to sdg and e for not only driving actively forward the development of the sunrise power link but also as being the off taker for pretty much uh, all the projects here in, uh, in imperial county Let's uh, look at, uh, let's make a reality check. Um, if we, these are projects that have been developed over the past years, and as we said, as I said earlier, it took uh, often longer than we anticipated. Moving forward, uh, the market is not that large uh, as we all would like to have. Uh, this slide shows the uh, most recent uh, diagram from the PUC, and uh, the bars represent 
already permitted contracts and uh, the line shows the 33% requirement. And as you can see by the red triangle that I added to this slide is that is the demand. So that is what the investor owned utilities are still planning to buy. And uh, that triangle is not only small in size, it's also pretty far out. So we're talking contracts in mostly 2019 and 2020. The, oh, sorry, it was too fast. Um, the demand that is uh, uh, where appetite is still in the California market is more on the uh, POU side, the public owned utilities. Uh, they are pr mostly procuring now compliance window two and uh, compliance window three. So we have to take into consideration that uh, the investor, that the public owned utilities represent about uh, uh, one third only of the energy market of California and uh, with 45 utilities, it's also a much more fragmented market than uh, the three investor owned utilities, which is a uh, much more difficult process for us to address them. And if you imagine it's gonna be much more difficult for us to pitch a project uh, located in Imperial Valley to the city of Palo Alto than uh, to San Diego, just to make one example. I want to talk about uh, two aspects of Imperial Valley and, and, and renewable. Um, in Imperial Valley, I think we all share the notion that it's uh, uh, a desirable location with lots of geothermal resources. There's lots of sun hours in, in Imperial Valley. Uh, you have land suitable for solar here than more than m most everywhere in the state. And uh, the state of California has invested three to three billion dollar in transmission with the Sunrise Power Link to the south and uh, the Colorado River to Valley Line in the north and Imperial Valley is right in the middle. So those are all the known facts. One fact that uh, is not talked much about and I think it deserves more attention is the quality of the power generated from solar in Imperial. As we integrate more solar into the grid, uh, the grid operator like the ISO and, and the PTOs are challenged, of course, by the intermittency of the resource. Uh, this slide shows a diagram of our MET stations here in Imperial Valley, and you, you can see uh, the production of uh, between October 16th and November 3rd uh, of 2012. And what is remarkable here is that uh, if you look at these production curves, they're all almost like textbook production curves, which means it's simply a bell-shaped curve. Now, that, that seems to be pretty standard, but uh, if you think about October through November and you imagine uh, that you would be somewhere closer to the coast or in other parts of California, uh, those production curves look very different. And in fact, all of our other projects that we have throughout California have uh, much more cluttered uh, production curves in this time of the year. This is, I think, a very important advantage for Imperial Valley simply because uh, as you deliver more production, uh, textbook production curves, the cost of integration into the grid is uh, lower. You need less to invest into the imbalanced service, uh, which is one of the, the costs that we're all concerned about when it comes to, to solar. Another opportunity that I see for Imperial Valley uh, is strangely enough uh, a rooftop. Um, the, there is a, when California started with renewable energy, they put it on the right track. Uh, California decided ground mounted uh, is the right location for solar. But somewhere along the way, as we in the industry uh, encountered problems with environmental permitting and uh, the lack of transmission over the last five or six years, there, there grew a bias towards uh, the rooftop and uh, today that rooftop momentum is gaining um, in strength uh, as, as we speak and I'm, I'm afraid that uh, the political environment uh, as well as the regulatory framework uh, is uh, continuing to prefer uh, in their future decisions rooftop o over ground mounted. Um, I do think that's a, a wrong path if you look simply from, it, uh, from an economical perspective I think the concerns of the past, such as uh, the difficulties on the environmental permitting or the lack of transmission is something that uh, the industry as well as the regulatory environment uh, has been able to address to a large degree. And uh, today uh, there, there is, with, with all the planned transmission and with the built transmission, that there is more transmission 
to, to satisfy the uh, RPS than, than in the past. And I think uh, there was also a large progress on the environmental side to, to find locations uh, for, for the sites. So if you look at the installation cost, uh, I have here a diagram that shows 2011 cost because those were the ones where we, we got the public, uh, a hand of public cost. Um, on the rooftop, the predominant form of installation today is uh, solar lease. And the solar lease, uh, in 2011, the average cost for implementation was $8 per watt. At the same time, uh, you were able to install solar on the ground between $2 and $2.50. So just looking at it from an installation cost, you have already a uh, delta between 2 and uh, 4x. Now, a lot of proponents of uh, this rooftop solar are saying that uh, you don't need transmission if, if you're on, on uh, somewhere in, on, on the rooftop in the load center, which is true, because obviously you are already there, you don't need to transmit the power. But even if you take the worst case, even if you say your project needs a new 500 kV line, which truly is the, the, the worst case, and uh, you take Sunrise Powerlink as an example, because we're here in, in Imperial, Sunrise Powerlink's costs were uh, for 2,000 megawatt, uh, about $1.8 billion, though so that's about 90 cents per watt. So you still can afford a lot of transmission, even in the worst case, to and still be much cheaper on the ground than um, on, on the roof. And that's just the installation cost. The other and as important factor is just the energy harvest. If you just consider how many homes are ideally located in a uh, area where you have the uh, good sunshine. I mean, most of the homes are along the, the coast, and we all know there is a lot of marine layer, and and, and uh, not there's a diffused light. Not a lot of homes are also ideally located towards the sun, while every ground-mounted installation is uh, precisely oriented to maximize the uh, energy harvest. Uh, if you look at the operation maintenance aspect, obviously uh, a ground-mounted installation is being professionally supervised over the lifetime of a project with 25 years. Um, I haven't looked at how homeowners treat their installation, but uh, I doubt that uh, all of them are cleaning them on a frequent basis uh, over 25 years. I also doubt that uh, they are replacing an inverter as the inverter starts to weaken. But that is all done uh, on a ground-mounted system. So not only do you pay much less to install it on the ground, but you also harvest much more energy as, as you put them uh, on the ground uh, in the right location with the right orientation and has a, have a professional uh, management of uh, the, the generator. Uh, why do I bring this up? Simply because I, I believe that uh, there is an opportunity for the stakeholder in Imperial Valley to get involved in the decisions that are happening this year and next year in Sacramento and San Francisco and within the, the state of California to communicate what the uh, advantages are of Imperial Valley to work with uh, real cost data and, and show the decision makers whether it's wise to uh, install and, and, and devise new programs to install, uh, con continue to install solar on the roof or whether it makes sense to continue to install them on the ground. I think that's uh, an important decision. Here's a little bit more detail on, on uh, the breakdown between ground-mounted solar and, and rooftop. The, the key difference why rooftop is so much uh, uh, more expensive it's on, on the installation side, it's very intuitive. I think installation um, is, is clear why it's more, why it's more expensive. Uh, often you have a, a roof retrofit, but the key difference on, on uh, rooftop solar, specifically on these, is that you have a high transaction cost since for every uh, for every system on the roof, you have to go through the whole uh, uh, process of tax equity, of uh, the, the, the debt, the same way you do it for a ground-mounted system, yet you have a, a very tiny scale, and that overhead is uh, simply the, the difference between uh, rooftop and uh, ground-mounted solar. Just to summarize, what, what do I believe are the opportunities for Imperial Valley? First, uh, I, obviously, there, there are future demand drivers such as uh, there are talks in California for a higher RPS than 33%, which I, be, I believe Imperial Valley can benefit. Uh, electric car will drive for further growth. Um, most of the utilities have not forecasted uh, a load growth um, in, in their resource plans, and 
uh, we, we might see some increase in load growth, which would be a further driver for our industry. But uh, I would like to have a, to make a call to action to Imperial Valley to, to get more involved on, on the state level and, uh, and, and drive decisions that are important uh, for the energy of, of the Imperial Valley. One example, for instance, is uh, the RAM program. Uh, the projects in the IID balancing authority have been excluded from the RAM program in the past. SDG&E in December started an initiative to change it and uh, IID and the county have supported that initiative and I think that's just one example where uh, it's important to uh, make the voice heard in, in Sacramento and make sure that, and, and San Francisco, and make sure that uh, the Imperial Valley gets its fair share. And then the second point, uh, as we've discussed uh, before, I think uh, on the legislature side and, and uh, regulatory framework, it's important to not let uh, uh, rooftop be become the, the main uh, market segment in California. I think we have to communicate the price points and, and the benefits of uh, the different installations of, uh, of solar. And uh, I, don't th I think that's the right thing to do for Imperial, but I think also that's the right thing to do for California and for the ratepayer and for our industry. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Uh, next, we have uh, Carl Stills, who is going to make a presentation with the uh, slide projector. Hi, I'm Carl Stills. I'm the energy manager for IID. While I wait for these slides to come up, uh, I will say that uh, you're, you're, I'm kind of in a dilemma here because I've never, like my good friend Andy Horn, I've never met a microphone I didn't like. Uh, but if I looked at the model that is presented to us by Socrates, who used to give long soliloquies to his followers, and they poisoned him, uh, I'll try to get through this talk as fast as I can uh, so that I don't find any little surprises when I go back and drink my coffee. happened there. Uh, as you're probably aware, the West is the fastest growing region in the United States, and the expected growth is supposed to be about 45% uh, between the years 2000 and 2030. And with that growth, many states in, are adopting very aggressive renewable energy standards. Uh, we're driven by RPS, we're driven by greenhouse gas. If you look at the slides, you can see the various requirements that the states in the West are uh, adhering to, and by far, California is the most aggressive. 33% uh, renewable by 2020, and the 1990 greenhouse gas levels by 2020. 80% uh, below 1990 levels by 2050. The other states have similar goals, but not as aggressive as California. These three factors combine to create a significant demand for investment in renewable energy facilities. Because re most renewable resources are located far from load, it requires a significant investment in transmission infrastructure. It also necessitates that utilities align policies and operations in such a way they facilitate, not prevent it. I think in Imperial Valley, what we found is that if the agencies will work together and respect the different agency boundaries, respect the integrity of the different BAs, that then we're in a position to find solutions to provide and facilitate the renewable growth and that is abounding in the area. Uh, the renewable market in the Southwest is still nascent and growing. However, there are factors that uh, uh, are going to affect that. And some of you have talked about that. I'll talk a little further down the road. Uh, IID's goal is to be a transmission source for future renewable energy development that powers the Southwest. And, but to do that, we're adopting efficient forward thinking, thinking policies. We're actually trying to promote an environment that is providing solutions for the renewable developers here in Imperial Valley 
looking at what is the state's requirements for renewable, how do we get that renewable to market, uh, how do we get it through the difficult uh, contract uh, negotiations that go on. It's easy to say we're just going to do it, but again, the devil's in the details on how to make that work. Uh, the other thing that we have to do is we have to expand our transmission system, linking IID to numerous transmission interconnection points that deliver to new and existing domestic, domestic and international markets. Uh, as you've heard from Mr. Herman, as you've heard from Mr. Weisgall, uh, and I'll show you an, a similar chart, the ILU markets are basically fully described. There is very little room now for more subscription in the remo renewable arena. Uh, but that doesn't mean that's the only market. That means that's one market that you have to wait on low growth. There are other markets. There are markets to the east. There are markets to the south. Our transmission strategy is to look at transmission to open those markets up. Uh, we want to build partnerships. Obviously, transmission is very, very, very expensive. And I really do believe that the key to making this work is strategic partnerships. How are we going to move forward? What transmission is going to be built? Where is it going to be sited? Where are the interconnection points going to be? Who are going to be the partners involved in building that transmission? And the other side of that is how do we pay for it? Uh, obviously, you can't build transmission and not have a revenue stream that's able to pay for it, or you take those uh, costs and put them on the back of your existing rate payers. IID doesn't have that many rate payers. We also operate in, a, in an area that has about a 30% unemployment. So it's unfair for us to put those costs on the backs of our existing rate payers. We have to figure out how to do this so we can create the right revenue source to be able to pay for the transmission assets that are required without stranding those investments. Again, you saw a similar chart from Mr. Herman. This is a chart looking at the subscription of the IOUs, which was the largest market. And that little dotted line that is up there on that chart was their contracts that are in place. This was the status of the contracts as of last year but you can see where they had oversubscribed to the market. Most of this was intermittent. This is a problem that we're gonna have to deal with. I think Mr. Weisgall uh, uh, alluviated to uh, a EIM market. But if you look at the intermittent resource load, the solar load in the middle, and what happens when the sun comes up, solar comes on. What happens when the sun comes down, solar comes off. Most of the contracts in California were intermittent loads. Uh, it creates a huge system stability issue. Uh, if you look at the far right side of this chart, what you'll see is when the sun goes down and solar starts coming off, the ramp swings that are on the California transmission system are going to be in as high as 13,500 megawatts in two hours. I heard Friday they're looking at 17,000 megawatts over a three hour period, which creates some huge stability issues. Uh, go back and how you would regulate this, somewhere if you had base load renewables, you would minimize those swings, okay? So base load has been so far pretty much out of the equation we need to get base load back in the equation. The other thing this will do will drive the need for some type of storage. How do we regulate this so that when the sun goes down, we have time to operate the system and shape the storage? So storage, storage batteries, different types of technology to provide storage are gonna be a key. Uh, the other thing that this will do is look at the EIM market, fast ramping gas turbines. Uh, to be able to pick up those swings that this comes off, something's going to have to come on to replace it. So with the big three fully subscribed, unless RPS is increased, and if it is increased, I do hope we look at it as increased with baseload requirements, songs, obviously, once through cooling, uh, 
the, the gas turbines at Huntington Beach, uh, they have that same type of a problem. If you look at that, that's going to create a huge problem. We have transmission lines that are loaded to the hilt to import power uh, to bring energy to the coastal markets up there. It's creating new uh, operational problems on transmission lines because we're getting up to our system operating limits and stressing those out. So if we do look at a state regulation change, and I hear right now they really want to uh, solve this uh, grid stability issue before they even really want to get to that. But if they do, they need to do it intelligently so that we have the base load and the intermittent in some type of balance so you get grid stability. Uh, obviously, we don't want to operate a system or a transmission system that is going to be unstable and create uh, outages. So we've got to do it a little bit smarter than we've done it before. Uh, <coughs> With this, and you've heard a little bit about the EIM or the energy imbalance market in order to solve this problem. The key to solving the energy imbalance and if you're not familiar with energy imbalance, it's multiple BAs with multiple generators. And typically, IID runs its own BA. So if we have an imbalance at our tie points with, with our other balancing authorities, we will either regulate that with the other authority by either curtailing the inflows to, a, to an area or dispatching counterflow to that area to create that balance in the market. Uh, but in an EIM market, it's multiple balancing authorities where you use the lowest economic, economically dispatched energy to solve that imbalance problem. So it's on a much wider scale. But in order to do that, you've got to have transmission. Transmission is constrained. Transmission is expensive. So you're going to have to have transmission to make an imbalance market work. In the past, IID has stood solidly behind renewable energy development, and we'll continue to advance the industry. Uh, we've transported geothermal since the early 70s. We've been recognized by the Geothermal Energy uh, uh, Association uh, for our efforts in doing that. Uh, we've been using locally produced energy. Uh, our board and our management took the stance that we weren't going to buy RECs, we were going to buy energy, we were going to be promoting energy. So everything that we have on our portfolio right now is an actual contract with a renewable developer. Uh, I think Tina will speak a little bit more to this, but we've dedicated 25,000 acre feet of ag water to uh, uh, non-ag industrial projects, renewable development is that. Uh, and we've been meeting with legislatures and uh, regulators to uh, garner support. Obviously, the RAM mechanism is, is one issue. San Diego is pushing that to expand it down to Imperial Valley. We actively support that. And we've been addressing our policies. We've been doing a lot of things. Uh, we've developed an economic development rate. Our, wheeling rate before was based on 100% capacity. We have since developed an energy-based rate that, for inter that helps the intermittents, $3.94 per megawatt hour. Uh, streamlining the oat process, uh, we had a fairly rigid oat process. We're now making that a more flexible oat process so that we can actively work to support the development that's in the queue and be flexible enough to move that, those projects forward when they get PPAs. Uh, uh, again, the CPUC finding uh, 1,400 megawatts of RA on IID system is huge. That will come into play at the next RFO uh, from the Cal ISO and the uh, participating utilities. Uh, we're in the process of creating a backfeed tariff. How do we uh, allow generators to come into our territory, serve distribution loads. So we're looking at that. And uh, again, we're interested in protecting the integrity of our BA, not just from a selfish standpoint, but from a reliability standpoint. 
we have such a extreme heat, we have a life or death situation down here. People are without power for a long period of time. We do not want to be in somebody's lower queue. We want to maintain our own integrity, maintain our own system, be able to return that energy as fast as we possibly can. So that's, that's one of the business rules that we've been looking at. And we're presently planning about 200 million in transmission expansion uh, to deliver energy to the multiple markets that we've been talking about. If you look at our transmission expansion plan, this is it over a wider area. Uh, is there a... Yep, no pointer. So I'll, I'll look at this. Our IV sub is in the lower left-hand corner down here. Our uh, knob sub is over here, interfacing to North Hela, Blythe, and then Mirage Devers in the upper left-hand corner. And I'll go over some of the projects. Our tr transmission line expansion, we're looking at incremental expansion. We're also working on the next phase of that. We're looking at line clearance for a 500 kV line to run from Midway to Mirage Devers. Uh, we're also looking at, from our midway out to the Salton Sea, uh, right in the middle of the Salton Sea, we have what we call our uh, midway to banister line. We're putting a line around as a collector line around the Salton Sea for the renewables there in the area so we can get them into major transmission components. Down in the lower left-hand corner, we're looking at how do we build our system to be able to export the energy either to IV sub or th up through Mirage Devers to the Cal ISO. We're going to be looking at components going over to North Gila, uh, maybe a 500 kV line from IV sub to East High Line sub to uh, North Gila, and then from North Gila, we'll be working with APS. We're looking at a North Gila to Haciampa or Palo Verde tie up there with 500 kV. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through each one of these projects. I've kind of described them. If you want to get with me afterwards, I'll, I'll be happy to go through each one of these with you. I'll just quickly scroll through them if you want to read them. Uh, it's our Path 42. I will say something about this one. We are presently in the process of doing Path 42. There are two components to Path 42. Uh, the, the path rating is, we're working with SCE, SCE's looking at their side, IID's looking at their side, so we're not just building a bridge to nowhere, we're actually going to be able to move energy through it. It's presently rated at 600 megawatts. We're putting in a RAS scheme. The RAS scheme will allow us to, uh, when we get the energy flow, to get that rating from 600 to 800 megawatts. We're in the process of doing the environmental. We're going to be reconducting that line to get the thermal rating up. When the energy is there, we'll re-rate that. That will take it from 800 to 1,500 megawatts, which will give us export capacity to the north. That is happening as we speak. IID's board has voted to go ahead and put that in place. So we are working on that uh, right now. Uh, again, I've talked about our midway to Bannister. That's being built incrementally. Uh, our next phase, uh, the next five and a half miles, uh, eight and a half miles already been built. The next five and a half miles in the planning stages, we're moving forward with that. And I've talked about that one. El Centro switching station to IV sub. I do want to talk about this one a little bit. There are two components of this. This is a S line rebuild. It's a 230 volt uh, uh, rebuild of, of the line from our switching station. There's another component that we're looking at on that. It's called a policy driven PTO. Uh, we presently have a bid in with the Cal ISO to uh, supply and own this P P PPTO. Uh, we're waiting for the response on that bid to see whether we get awarded that. If we do, we will have an interconnection point coming across our canal uh, for interconnection for hooking up renewable resources there. So, IV Dixieland is a component 
that will actually back up our S line that goes from Imperial Valley to Dixieland. Uh, this will allow us to import uh, energy uh, through the S line, and if the S line needs to be taken out of service or backed up, then we can export it in through Ivy Dixieland. So it gives us a lot more flexibility in, in a line that is presently radial with exporting energy going out. We want the flexibility to move the energy around and still get it to market or to import it for our own personal use. And then again, the High Line to North Hila, to Haciampa, uh, we're looking at getting and creating transmission to multiple markets. We want to go to Mexico. We're in discussions with CFE. Uh, we're in discussions with SRP, WAPA, APS to get transmission out to the Arizona markets. Uh, we've talked with the POUs going north. Uh, we've been in discussions to see if uh, a Green Path North type, type project is going to come back. We're looking at inner ties to strengthen our inner ties between the Cal ISO. And the reality of the situation is what IID is doing is looking at the development, what is going to be required, when it's going to be required, and how do we get your energy to market. And then the Highline to CETES, that's the one to CFE. And in conclusion, the renewable energy industry will continue to grow as RPS requirements are increased or low growth increases. Uh, much of the energy developed in future years will be serving public power utilities in California as well as, well as other entities. I know the state of California still wants to look at how to get most of the renewables that they can to keep it within the state. They do need the baseload. They will need the baseload geothermal. Uh, hopefully, that next round of RFOs, you'll see a push on base load and they'll get back to re intermittent renewables uh, down the road. Uh, but we're trying to develop a framework that will allow us to support this look. We're trying to be intelligent, to be out front, see what the variables are in the market, to make sure that we're not spending money that is going to be stranded, but to spend the right money at the right time with the right partner to move this program forward to support the renewable industry down here. Thank you. Okay, Tina Shields is quickly on my heels. Tina? So Armando's already warned me he's gonna time me but I have half as many slides as Carl and I talk twice as fast, so I think I'm pretty good. So I'm a little fish out of water here because I'm gonna talk about water and not energy so much, but hopefully how it correlates to your projects and to the issues you have. Go to the first slide here. This is a slide, let me get past this one. Oh, I guess I have to do it. Uh, this is a slide that I prepared a couple years ago, primarily for this type of conference. I would never take this slide out of the district and to the Colorado River conferences I'm speaking at tomorrow because it wouldn't be perceived very well. But there was a concern raised probably five or six years ago as these projects were starting to materialize, not only the renewable energy, but a lot of the development and housing projects when we were going through that boom. And it was whether there was sufficient supplies within the district from a water perspective to handle that growth and the increasing demand. And so just a little background for those of you that aren't familiar, IID has an extremely senior water right. And from California's perspective, we have access to 4.4 million acre feet of Colorado River water each year. And IID supply is over 70% of that at 3.1. So you can see just looking at the basin of the entire contracting system for the Colorado River region, we have an extremely large water right. Back in 2008, the board anticipated a lot of these projects that were coming in the demands and asked that staff work to develop an integrated water resources management plan to address not only the projects that we were starting to see locally, but a lot of the projections as to how the growth would occur in the future. So we worked for about two years to develop 
what essentially was a large scale planning process to identify projects that would either augment our water supply, contribute to conservation projects that we were already planning on implementing, or policies that could address those same types of constraints and serve to either reduce demand or increase the supply. We completed this in 2009, and it was a pretty rushed project toward the end and not a lot of opportunity for stakeholder input. So as that project was presented to the board, they asked us to take the time and the effort to go out and talk to the various interest groups and stakeholders who had an interest not only in the existing supplies and how those were used, but the new projects and the new uses that we anticipated coming online. What we did to develop this was work to achieve what's known in California as an integrated water management plan. And it, it's a planning tool that you use on a regional basis, and there are certain standards set by the state of California Department of Water Resources. When you finalize this and you come up with an adopted plan, it then qualifies you for access to a lot of the proposition and state bond monies that you wouldn't have absent this participation. So this was a real collaborative effort where we got people in the same room that had completely different priorities and interests. We had the farming community, we had the industrial users, we had the city representatives, and I think we spent close to two years trying to outline all the different water issues, and not just supply and demand, but flood control and drainage and reclamation and water treatment, and look ahead and see where we were going. It's a hard process because people's views were so different and so varying on how you should manage those supplies, and that really ended up being the focus of this effort was supplies and demand. But I think it was a really good, broad perspective. Everybody was in the same room. They understood the issues. We didn't agree, but nobody was hurt in the process, and we're all moving forward towards this end. That plan was adopted by the IID in Imperial County earlier this year and late last year along with some of the cities, and as time goes by, more and more of the cities are approving that plan, and it therefore puts it in effect from a large-scale planning perspective and prioritizes local projects. But I think the number one outcome of this project was that mindset of thinking regionally and not just thinking about your project or your particular use. What also came out of that process was a concern about how do we address these near-term needs and demands, and how do we meet the planning requirements that are necessary for the county to permit these type of projects. So in order to meet those longer term reliability supply requirements, the IID developed what we call the interim water supply policy. And our board designated 25,000 acre feet of our annual water supply to be available for new projects that were not agriculturally based. That's a process that we have finalized in this document. Um, we, it turns out there's a lot of interest in this, but not a lot of projects. So I think as the solar projects develop, we'll see a lot more access. But we have issued three contracts to date. One project is actually in production, the Hudson Ranch project. And we look forward to working with you all to access those supplies and, and put your name on a component of that water. So there are, from our perspective, sufficient supplies to address all the projects that are in the queue. The basic tenets of this policy is once you're done with your CEQA process, you come work with IID, we'll develop the language from the contract templates and all the documents necessary for our board to issue that water supply contract. The two components with that are when you come and sign up and we get everything done, you pay a water supply reservation fee and that puts a hold on the water. So if your project needs a little bit more time for financing or to actually occur, at least you have a certainty that that supply is set aside for you. There's also a water supply development fee, and this is a little concerning. Some folks don't like the high price associated, but what it does is provide the certainty and reliability that that water has your name on it, will be available for the term of your project, and you don't have to worry about other issues related to water supply reductions or curtailments. This leads into some of the issues we're facing now. The district has a large annual water supply, but the way water accounting works on the Colorado River is it starts January 1st from an accounting perspective, and on December 31st, you turn into a pumpkin and you start out all over again. So we have an annual supply, but if we overuse it, 
the district has an obligation to pay that water back through conservation to keep Lake Mead whole. Unfortunately, if we underuse the supplies, we don't have the ability to bank or storage opportunities, and you lose that water to a junior priority holder. So because of that, um, the contracts and the water supply policy are very important to industrial users because it allows them to lock in with certainty that supply, even in years when you might have shortages or have payback obligations. And the monies created from that fee will go to fund these supply augmentations or water conservation projects. Uh, the tenants for industry um, in an apportionment year, which is where the district is looking at from an agricultural perspective of providing a, a, essentially a cap on a farm level basis, the water supply for industry will be under the terms of your contract. This also led to concern, particularly as we saw the solar projects being developed, about what would happen to the water supplies associated, associated with new projects that were significantly less than the agricultural use that was occurring. So if you don't use the water, you essentially use it the way riparian rights work here in California. And over time, other users develop an interest in using that water or supplies. In Arizona, they had the, the situation that California was developing a reliance on their supplies, so they developed a groundwater banking system. Our concern locally is that water we don't use flows to the urban coast, and as cities develop, it's a little hard sometimes to unuse that water. So there was some special legislation legislation created that redefined fallowing that allowed us to tear off the county's permitting process. Instead of doing a zone change, they did a conditional use permit, and the legislation allows us to classify these solar or other types of projects with significantly lower water use demands as a fallowing for purposes of putting IID's name on that water. Unfortunately, the legislation also limits the use of that water for transfer and environmental purposes but we are looking to see if there's some opportunities to expand that in the future. This resulted in a temporary land conversion fallowing policy. We call it the solar policy because that's all the projects that have qualified for it right now. So we are working to um, implement this in conjunction with the water supply contracts. And I do know our board is looking at expanding some of the tenants of that. So there may be some re revisions coming forth with that. And that's all I have for now. Uh, you may have noticed that we're running a little behind. Uh, what we're going to do is if you have questions, there's a couple of uh, folks from IVEDC here that are gathering cards. If you would like, what you can do is write your name and email address on the back of the card and we can answer your question that way. I uh, would like to do it, yeah, please. What I'd like to do is invite Armando. Thank you, Tom. Is this my watch? It's a nice one. <laughs> I just found out that I went to school with Tina uh, right about the same time uh, in the 90s, but I never saw her. I, I, think, I think I realized why I think I signed up for the seven-year program and you signed up for the four-year program. <laughs> so uh, I'm very pleased to be here to repres uh, be represented in Perry County. And uh, I have a, a, a couple of slides I'd like to show you, but let me first learn how to use this. Okay, so I'd like to take you on a tour of Imperial County for the benefit of those uh, of you that are here for the first time. And I think even if you are here for, for some time, you're gonna find some of these numbers interesting. Um, this is Imperial County. Um, as you can see, it's very arid. Uh, the middle portion of that exhibit is the agricultural zones in Imperial County. Uh, they are approximately 530,000 30, acres of land under production. Uh, we are the eighth largest county in, in California out of 58 counties uh, in terms of land mass. And I was talking to our agricultural commissioner last week and she told me that we're in the top 10 in terms of agricultural production. Uh, we vary between seven and 10. Um, and in terms of population, we're ranked 31st. So we're kind of nestled in between all the counties with LA County being number one. So out of the nearly 3 million acres of land uh, in Imperial County, which represents about uh, 4,500 square miles, roughly 50% of that is owned by the federal government. 
uh, in the form of the military bases, uh, testing facilities, and, and land that is basically managed by the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, that's a, quite a chunk of land. And 1% uh, of it is uh, managed by the state. That uh, if you look at the picture, that oddly shaped blue area is the Salton Sea, and that is about 7% of the entire county. Um, with the rest of it, the rest of the county, approximately 41% being under the responsibilities, the land use responsibilities of the county, which is our responsibility. So uh, another interesting note, um, I, I, at least I found it interesting, was all the cities in the valley and all the uh, urbanized incorporated areas, unincorporated areas of the county represent less than 1% of the total um, land mass in the valley. So anyway, that's your introduction to Imperial County. Um, the next couple of slides, I'm gonna try to go a, a little fast on these because I know Andy Horn's gonna give you a uh, more in-depth uh, presentation on some of these projects. So we zoom in into the heart of the valley, the agricultural zone, and this map essentially shows you uh, the number of geothermal plants that we permitted in the county over the last couple of years. Uh, so we've been doing geothermal plants for a while now. We've become, I think, I like to think we've become experts in processing these types of permits. So, so far we have a total of 16 plants with a total probable output of about 531 uh, megawatts. The next uh, slide shows uh, a si same zoomed area. And let me tell you, this map uh, last year was changing almost monthly because we kept adding projects and more projects and some projects went away. But as you can see, this map shows uh, uh, a depiction of all the solar projects that have been submitted uh, to the county over the past three years. As you can see, some of them are clustered in the lower end of the valley for obvious reasons, uh, connectivity and proximity to the interconnection. And as Carl showed at an exhibitor earlier, some of the projects are um, clustered in the north end of the valley for that future expansion of the uh, midway uh, transmission line. So overall, we have a total, of, over the past three years, we've had a total of 23 projects. Uh, eight, 18 of which have been reviewed, approved by the Board of Supervisors, uh, which represents about 14,000 acres of, of land and uh, with a total probable output of about, about 1,950 uh, megawatts. Four of those projects are under construction today. Uh, they are on the lower portion of the map there and um, one project is, has been constructed and is fully operational now and that's the, the IV Solar One project in the north end. In terms of wind, uh, for those of you that came down from San Diego, you probably noticed the small turbines out there. Um, they're surrounding uh, the uh, community of Acatillo. And that project was originally uh, proposed at about 16,000 acres of land with about 200 turbines. And it was uh, reduced in scope in an effort to avoid environmental impacts. So this is a, a good project um, that when we apply the environmental requirements, we were able to uh, avoid and reduce the scope of it simply to minimize the, uh, the environmental impacts. And by the way, I have a quick thought. I saw John Davison up there, and John Davison's firm worked on the environmental document with the county and BLM, and I'm happy to report that this document for this project actually received, was nominated for a state award and a national award, and next week we are going to receive his company in the county an award for an outstanding uh, environmental assessment document. So uh, we did a good job with that, I guess. So overall, over the, the past 36 months, we've been really busy at the county, and not just the planning department, but every other department that participated in, in the process of entitlement for this project. Uh, CEO's office, the county commissioner's office, act commissioner, I mean, every other department participated. So we reviewed and approved a total of 42 projects uh, that have a probable output of about 3,400 megawatts. So we've been uh, extremely busy uh, at the county level. Uh, just the other day, um, I was uh, talking to Charlene, she's out there, and uh, I asked her, uh, Charlene, what should I tell the group about the process, the entitlement process, and she said, why don't you tell us how easy you're gonna make it 
to process projects in Imperial County. <laughs> that, that was quite uh, comical. But uh, that, I started thinking about the process and the process we've designed for some of these projects. And I don't think the, pro the process is easy. Uh, I think, I think the process, uh, and, and, and I don't think the project should be complicated either, but I do think that we have a process that's fair and friendly, uh, I think. And let me share with you uh, some of the, uh, a couple of enabling uh, local uh, legislative policies that we use to make the process friendly and fair. Uh, as you may know, we are one of the few counties that have a geothermal element in the general plan and there's a whole bunch of enabling policies in there that allows us to treat renewable energy projects compatible with ag and compatible with other uses in the county. Uh, we use that a lot to make findings for some of the projects that we processed through the entitlement process. Another important piece of uh, legislation locally is the decision of our county board of supervisors to allow us and uh, to treat some of these projects, especially solar, as compatible uses with ag uh, and as temporary uses uh, in ag. So those two pieces of uh, uh, policy have really allowed us to, to design a process that is fair, that is friendly, and not cumbersome at all. So um, let me talk a little bit about the CUP process. As, as you know, uh, the conditional use permit process is used, heavily used by many counties, many cities to regulate projects and condition projects and basically allow us to, to take the project characteristics and, and uh, learn about that project and condition the project based on the project scope. We use that uh, a lot and what we do is we take some of the policies in the general plan and the directives by the board and we process uh, these solar projects through a 30-year conditional use permit, which is, a, which is sort of an interim use. Some of the key features of the, of the CUP process, which are very important, is that we require a reclamation plan along with a bond. And what, what that is, is that we require a very detailed uh, reclamation plan that tells us that the land will be returned to formable conditions after the useful life of the project. So with that, uh, we are able to make the findings that these are interim uses and um, that we can restore the land uh, to fumble conditions. We don't, um, the land use remains uh, agriculture and the, we, we, don't, we don't need to change the zoning and change the land use, which creates a whole bunch of problems for us if we do that. And then we use the CEQA process to analyze the projects environmentally. So if you have a project, if you're intending to uh, apply for one of those, one of, one of the, or submit an application to the planning department, I do encourage you to visit the planning department and go through the uh, pre-application process with us. We have a free of charge uh, process where we meet with you, we invite other departments in the county to essentially go over with you and go explain to you some of the do's and don'ts of the process. Uh, we learned a heck of a lot already about renewable energy projects, so we try to share with you some of the things that you should be doing in your projects and things to avoid. Um, you know, for example, uh, we've seen a lot of project descriptions that are very unrealistic. What we'd like to see is that you uh, design a project description that's realistic. Uh, for example, don't tell us you're going to be building this project in three months when realistically you're going to be building it over a year because as you condense your project construction, then you, know, you um, increase the level of impacts. And then we end up giving you some mitigation that's very, very uh, cost prohibitive. Um, the next thing you should do is to try to talk to your neighbors as you start doing your land assemblage, your site selection, and tell them what you're doing. Tell them that you're gonna be doing your project and try to learn try to find out what their needs are so that when we eventually go to planning commission or, or board, we don't, we, we don't see these people complaining about the project because you never listen to their needs. Uh, we do encourage you to visit with the IID and visit with external agencies to, uh, all those agencies that provide services to you, to let them know about your project 
Again, we don't want to send out a document and only to find out that they don't know about the project and they're gonna have all this list of an additional requirements. And then uh, some of the things we learn, uh, our, our uh, planning commission and board really frown upon using highly uh, prime land and highly productive uh, land. So when you're doing your site selection and you're doing your, your land acquisition, make sure that you have land that is not as productive or that has a low yield. That way we uh, don't have to spend so much time writing mitigation against that. Try to avoid uh, Williamson Act contract land. Uh, I know Sal's here. We went through this process uh, of canceling the contracts and it was very time consuming, time burdensome, and very costly. So as you're doing your, your, your site selection, try to avoid that altogether because it's gonna create another layer of requirements that may end up being a little long, uh, extending your process a little longer. And then uh, l the last piece of recommendation that I have is that, you know, we, we've, again, we learned a heck of a lot about the, the process and we do strongly recommend that you come into this process uh, with the knowledge that you might have to do an environmental impact report. There's a lot of uh, organized labor union groups that are very interested in about protecting the environment. So they will attack the environmental analysis that we do and simply we can't do uh, a, as good of a job with a neck deck that we can with an environmental impact report. So we really uh, encourage you to come in and let us know that you want to interested in doing an EAR right away so that we can start the process. Uh, we've been able to talk to our consultants and uh, shrink the EIR preparation time from a year to about half the time. So if we come in into the process thinking that you're gonna do that, we can start the EIR process right away. We go to uh, EEC, which is the Environmental Evaluation Commission Committee, process as, a, as an informational item, and we go into a full bone EIR production. So anyway, those are my recommendations if you're thinking of processing, and that makes the process, I think, uh, Charlene friendly and uh, and fair, right? So thank you. That's all I have. Well, again, we appreciate your patience. We realize that the panel is running over a little bit. Um, we're going to start with the next panel momentarily, but we wanted to make sure that you received the information. Um, I do have a question for Scott. And Scott is going to be over by the doors over there. So the person who submitted the question, please step over there. Um, if you have other questions, just give us your, your name and your email on the back of the card, and we'll send you the question. And with that, I want to thank all of you. I want to thank our panelists, and welcome.